Hello, good morning. It's Monday the 22nd of November. My name is Willem Bermanje. I am the Strategic Communications Director at Forbo Flooring and we are doing a series of interviews around the COP26 climate conference. I will be talking to, just like I've, uh, like I've had in the past weeks, to Christina Gamboa, who is the CEO of the World Green Building Council from London. And in uh, Amsterdam, I will be talking to Marit Schroen, who is environmental entrepreneur and um, has been working with his, his agency on building a green environment already for decades and decades. We will come back to that. Now, um, I said one week ago, on Saturday. It was Alok Sharma who, after a long pause and a deep breath, expressed his disappointment at the result of the meeting, at the result of the conference. Um, Christina, did you have the same feeling when you were sitting there listening to him, that it did not go as well as we all thought? Well, um, thank you. I think that I felt um, that he did a great job, that overall the conference achieved some progress in a good package. Hmm? Mm -hmm. um, because I'm an optimist also <laughs> on a flag. But of course, there are some underlying things that we would have liked to see being addressed more profoundly. And it's about the principles of the Paris Agreement, of the symmetry of the, of the highest emitters, helping out the developing world in the journey towards embracing, no, uh, divesting from fossil fuels. And we still, that conversation, that solidarity didn't come through strong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So beyond that moment, that's my personal frustration, but okay. also from the region of the world I come from, from Colombia, that also strikes a chord. Yep. A lot of the world is disproportionately affected by climate change, and mm -hmm. that is still not there when we come to these annual climate conferences. Because you also wrote a very comprehensive article which can be read on your website, the website of the World Green Building Council, and there you actually say, well, now talking about win or lose distracts from the meeting in Egypt, 2022, COP27. What do you mean by that? Exactly. Well, when, when I say also progress, now 89% of the world has a net zero target. Of course, there's a lot of things we'll have to dig into what that means and how countries are going to get there. But as we go into Egypt, it means the agenda has to truly embrace not only mitigation, but adaptation, climate justice, and if you like, even uh, human rights. Hmm? Mm -hmm. It's going to be more of a conversation of uh, the need for people that are now in the front lines of, of climate change. How is the rest of the world going to help them adapt? But mm -hmm. how are we going to ensure that we don't continue to burden them with, with a weight, with a poor quality of life, if we can be more together in, in acting in the spirit of the Paris Agreement? Yeah. You have, of course, a professional um, interest in the built environment. We will be talking about that uh, uh, soon. Um, but I'd like to uh, ask Maurits, who has a somewhat broader perspective, who is perhaps more from his entrepreneurial background, looking at a holistic result for, from um, this uh, COP26 meeting. Maurits, for you, is the glass half full or half empty? Well, actually, um to put it in another way, um, in Glasgow, steps have been made, fortunately, mm -hmm. but leaps have been necessary. Mm -hmm. And so we are trying, we are promising ourselves to slow down the process of uh, polluting the atmosphere with CO2 mm -hmm. and methane and other greenhouse gases. We are promising to do that. A little, little action is being taken. But giant leaps are necessary. Yes. And we, we are talking with the laws of nature and not with laws that we can adapt or abolish or renew or whatever. And that's a, a big misunderstanding. I mean, um, Christina was talking about uh, all, all the countries having a, a net zero emission target somewhere in the future. That's true. But uh, the future that we're talking about concretely is way too far ahead 
So mm -hmm. um, the consequences of what we have been doing in, in, in the meantime will be very severe. I mean, we have now had 26 conferences, um, 26, and mm -hmm. nothing much has been done. Actually, uh, the emissions this year uh, have been greater than any, in any year of human history. So um, we are talking about uh, targets decades from now, but um, calculating back what should be done right now mm -hmm. uh, should be really frightening to any one of us because we should be in an emergency state. That's mind. also what you said we last time. Eh? Also last Sorry? time you, you uh, talked about, you, you, you did not talk about climate change, you talked about climate disaster. And you said yeah, those are actually the words that, that that you should be using because it is as severe as as that. Are you yeah. um, are you happy that now each and every year there will be a full climate summit? Is that going to work for you, Maurits? I think it's necessary because <clears throat> like what you see is uh, we have had the twenty six conferences. Um, the last big one, the first big one, was in two thousand and nine in Copenhagen, which in some way failed, but on the other hand, it established a two degree deadline, so to say. That's what was accepted globally. That mm -hmm. was a leap forward. Uh, there were no commitments made, but that was a principle that was being adopted. Then in 2015, Paris, uh, it, it went, but it's six years, six years of massive um, emissions further. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a step further. And now six years after that, Mm -hmm. uh, we have made some little steps on methane, on forests, on um, well, the, the talk on loss and, dam on, and, and damage, mm -hmm. uh, the climate justice issue, which in my opinion is pivotal. I mm -hmm. mean, if we don't talk, if we don't recognize that um, the richest part of the world is emitting, say, 90, 95% of yes. all emissions, and, and mm -hmm. the burden of the consequences of that is falling upon the 5%, which does not emit anything at all, hardly. So yes. if, we, if we do not start with acknowledging uh, the, the, the basis of all mm -hmm. this discussion, which, is, yeah. which should be climate justice and which should involve loss and damage and which would involve uh, taking seriously the $100 billion uh, mm -hmm. per year, yes. Uh, put into the sound. If we do not start there, we won't we won't get anywhere. No, no, no. And now you even get countries like India saying, well, you should give us some more time because we also need to profit from the wealth that coal and oil can bring because we have not been using so much in the past. Maybe yeah. uh, also it's a, it's a question between uh, what is happening in the countryside and what's happening in larger cities. Over 50%, 56% of the population is now living in urbanized areas. So the building and construction sector is a major contributor to global warming. Yep. Um, Christina, you said you were very pleased that now for the first time there was a day dedicated to the built environment and you were quite happy with the results I read from your article. Can you explain a little bit about, about that? Yes, of course. There's, there's, of course, many sectors that have to show up, right? Their leadership. We, I agree with Maritz. The countries have been too slow in shifting, mm -hmm. right? The geopolitics also haven't helped us. I guess I am happy with the results because we saw beyond the built environment also many industries showing up leadership and ambition in terms of uh, getting uh, more ambitious targets and inspiring governments to have the confidence to move further faster. And um, I was happy with the results because uh, we had over 130 events showcasing not only the awareness, yes. we're done with the awareness, showcasing mm -hmm. action. Yeah. So we saw on the official UNFCCC spaces, UK government pavilion, we, ha we saw conversations of country ministers, mayors, CEOs of leading uh, uh, industries in the built environment, showcasing what they're doing now, really ambitious work to inspire others to follow suit because there has been a lack of political will, will. And now there is now a call also for every cent to be invested in any industry to go beyond profit and do good. And mm -hmm. I think this COP, there was a big through the race to zero and the, and the, and the, and the race to resilience and the campaigns of the high level climate champions, they really mobilized the private sector and the private sector showed up. And the built environment is 
showcased as a critical climate solution. And of course, it's a hard uh, sector to decarbonize, mm -hmm. but yeah. it's saying we are in the transition, we are invested, we are committed, and we're, in, we're also here to disrupt and show the world what is a bad building from good infrastructure and what makes sense through different regions of the world. So yeah. I was very pleased. Okay, you also mentioned that rather than talking to heads of state and heads of government, it was particularly gratifying to talk to local mayors. So let's say the, the more smaller entities, because there, there you see things happening, there you see change. I think, Maurits, this is something that you also will come across in the many activities and the many meetings that you organize. Um, it doesn't need to come from our government. There is a large force within ourselves, within society, that is actually calling for this change. Um, I can completely agree, and also with Christina. Um, in the business sector, you see a, a lot of good initiatives and possibilities. Uh, um, I've mentioned the book, the, the book Drawdown by Paul Hawken, which lists the top 100 solutions to climate disruption, mm -hmm. which are not only feasible and off the shelf at the moment, and also financially um, feasible. Moreover, they are very profitable. Mm -hmm. So, it, in fact, it's very strange that governments, which should lead and which should set the standards uh, and put the right barriers for, for enterprises to uh, put their best efforts uh, within those those in within those frameworks, is not actually doing that because it's hampering at the moment mm -hmm. the companies that really want to stick their neck out, that really want to invest in a, innovation, that really want to uh, put their money in implementing climate solution um, mm -hmm. uh, devices or technology or whatever, they are actually helping the old industry, destroying the, the environment, which they should protect themselves. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a real strange thing that from the bottom up, from companies and also from mayors and, and, and individual districts, etc., that the action and, and the, 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 the spirit to solve the problem is there. And that governments on a, on a, on the national level uh, listen still to the old economy, which is destroying our future. Mm -hmm. One of one of the big topics, finance. Finance was to be regulated and was to be uh, set with within this conference. The one hundred billion that was needed every year, we didn't get it, and we only found out that we are needing more. Christina, um, on the on the finance side. Do you see that in the end that topic will be tackled maybe next year in Egypt? Yes, yes, I think so, because there's also beyond the, of course, the, the solidarity of the Paris Agreement, the need to deliver on the 100 billion annually of finance for developing countries to help them in this transition to a low carbon economy. And that's going to happen by 2023. It's going to be, a, be a, late, a bit late, but it's going to happen. But in the meantime, we also saw a lot of movement from the private finance, if you like. This uh, Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero was, was really interesting initiative. And uh, they announced that uh, almost 40% of global assets are now committed to this transition. Of course, it's in the works, but that means there's going to be very better clarity on, if you like, taxonomies or uh, asset classes where people are going to have signals of where to invest and where not. So there, there was some common ground. There was also this, this need of uh, showing that the, uh, this financial sector is in this uh, in this in this uh, space, and also willing to have the conversation on the just transition, and and of course much more is needed. But I think that yeah. was a very powerful signal, mm -hmm. and that also means business will have to uh, also adjust and be more transparent and be ready to attract high quality, sustainable finance uh, as yeah. this movement continues to gain traction. And then of course in Europe, Maurits, we will have the Green Deal coming into force in 2022. That is yep. legislation, that is taxes, that, that is finance. So yep. I, I, I think that a, a, having, a, having a green deal in Europe also really helps in this process. Very okay. much so, I guess, mm -hmm. very much so. Yeah. Um, there's also the green, taxon green taxonomy being issued by the European Commission, mm -hmm. um, which sets standards of where banks, investment funds, um, pension funds, etc., 
uh, insurance company can or may or are allow, allowed to invest in, mm-hmm. which is, I mean, there's a discussion uh, what should be in that taxonomy and what not, but yes. the fact that there is a real discussion on that within the framework of the of the Green Deal is important. What you see now also, to add to what Christina said, uh, many more pension funds are now withdrawing their money, divesting their money mm-hmm. from fossil fuel companies. Yes. Um, the agreement that was internationally made of governments that do not insure any more foreign investments or foreign um, capital uh, outflow um, mm-hmm. and implementation of, of fossil fuel projects yes. abroad yes. is also a signal. So the signs are getting to green. Yes, yes. that's also what I understand that. Having a line in there saying fossil fuels, uh, we should do something with with them in future, meaning we should get rid of them, actually also is a novelty in the declaration. Now, um, without knowing, the two of you have a common friend or the two of you know someone who um, who was at COP26. It's uh, Al Gore. Al Gore, who uh, used to be the next president of the United States. I saw him on television. He was still there. Christina listened to him. And when we had our little conversation just before this uh, uh, viewing, uh, you said, well, I heard him speak and the man has still got it. Now, Maurits, you uh, actually invited Al Gore to the Netherlands twice to... Yeah, five times, actually. Okay, well, okay, but uh, you, you, you did that... Um, with the viewing of his uh, movie, The Inconvenient Truth. For a long time, Mr. Gore has been the advocate for uh, warning about global warming, uh, CO2 buildup, that we need to do something. A a, a question to both of you. Who are the green leaders of today? Who who is really standing up today and uh, making a difference also on conferences like COP26? Um, you can think about it for a minute or so, but I think, Christina, you've been at the meeting. Was that was there someone who particularly struck you as inspiring, as, as powerful, as leading? I, I have to mention here the voices of, of young leaders that were allowed into the COP venue, and most of them had speeches throughout COP. Okay. Because, there, of course, from our... From the oldies, they're, they're, we showed up, right? But they, they are, they don't, they are calling it uh, openly of the schizophrenia of not moving quickly as an urgency. Mm-hmm. And um, and I saw, for example, this this uh, leader um, Clover from Australia, Vanessa from Africa. Right now, I don't remember her last name. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and uh, and they are basically, I, let's say, with all the all the um, stress they have because of the of the biodiversity crisis, mm-hmm. all the inequity, they're really uh, calling off leaders uh, to prove them wrong, if you like, that uh, they are not willing to make this world a better world. And and the, and it was really nice to not uh, have those voices just outside, but within the venue. And I really mm-hmm. admire that they showed up being so consistent, so straightforward, and so challenging to national leaders that are not okay. up to the task. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, of incre- they're into incremental change, and we yes. know that's not enough. Mm-hmm. And for you, Maurits, someone who stands out, a well, man, actually, a woman. Uh, I completely agree with uh, with you, Christina, because it's. Uh, I can mention names, or you can mention names. I can do that also. Uh, also, also from the Netherlands, but very many powerful people from from uh, the, the global south is called. Mm-hmm. Uh, after the big delegations of the fossil fuel industry that tried to defend their interests. The second largest uh, community um, present at, at uh, Glasgow, the COP, was from indigenous peoples. Mm-hmm. And indigenous peoples, um, years years ago, and in, 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 even in the recent past, were considered as a kind of, um, well, um, as a decoration. Mm-hmm. Uh, an Indian guy oh. with uh, with his global <laughs> traditional outfit, etc. But they are really the, the guardians of, of nature. They know to live with nature. I mean, 
we extract from nature and then we live from it, but they live with nature, uh, so they can guide the way. And uh, I think it's very um, hopeful, a hopeful sign that they uh, understand. Oh, now you break away. Okay, uh, so um, a, a, a good moment to, um, to, to say thank you for both of you and talking to me about the aftermath and the results of COP26. I asked Maritz earlier, is the glass half full or is it half empty? Um, I think we can agree that the, that the glass is half full and that the glass is filling up slowly and that the glass over the next years will become fuller and fuller. And like I said, when legislation steps in, when we need to pay taxes, when we are forbidden to drive fuel, fuel, fossil fuel cars, things will change. It is inevitable. Thank you for joining me. Um, sorry about the bad uh, connection at times. I hope the interview works out very well for all of you listening. Thank you for being with me. Bye-bye.